Hello ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to The Right Opinion, the home of a twat with too much free time. And TV show hosts, we've gone through a few. If you're watching because you love me, thank you. If you're watching because you don't love me, welcome. From the allegations that ended Ellen's illustrious TV career, to Liddy Singh's unfortunately fruitless foray into the world of late night. How the internet's inhabitants cross-pollinate to other platforms is a curious conundrum. Given many modern-day talk shows' reliance on social media for greater proliferation, they regularly experience the advantages and disadvantages of being able to answer immediately to an audience who can be known to turn on a dime. But it's a risk that many are willing to take, especially with the world as it is today. <laughs> How much of Jimmy Kimmel's beard is eyebrow pencil? <laughs> With video sharing and streaming platforms taking up a significantly larger market share than they used to, content running on syndicated and cable have needed to adapt to the evolving landscape, or risk being left behind. At the same time, variety can often be fleeting, and as we saw last year with the cancellation of Dr. Phil's self-titled TV show, at one point the basis of some of those viral content on YouTube, the internet moves fast, and the internet moves on. Late night shows still pull sizable ratings, but studios and networks are always going to be concerned with the trend, and in the past few years, late night shows have seen more endings than beginnings, particularly on the later night slots which were often used to test the potential of future content. It sent a message that the confidence in this format was waning. How come? Over the past few decades, ratings on many late night shows have remained solid thanks to their ability to tap into relevant issues and use the host's charisma to build a closer one to one relationship with the audience. The losses over TV have often been filled with the YouTube success, whose monetization is maximized due to the lucrative deals with the video sharing platform. But in the past few years, the path that many of these shows appear to be on is somewhat diverse from the tastes of the youngest target demographic, Gen Z. And for us, it wasn't hard to see why. It reminded me of me a little bit because I wear striped shirts. Mm -hmm. I've worn these heart sunglasses because my daughters, just as a joke, they have them, and I, as a joke, I put them on. So I've done this. And I love Yacht Rock and being breezy. So I'm like, yeah, that kind of, and I like the blue. Dude, look at us. In the past few years, there has been a different kind of variety on the internet, one where a concept generates a significant degree of fame, but one more akin to infamy. And even if a trend is well documented, even popular to a degree, it may be treated with contempt by those who engage with them most. It seems that the writers and producers of these shows didn't really grasp this, and their approach to the interests of Gen Z has been one that often appeared to alienate viewers more than it did entice them. In essence, Late Night was becoming out of touch, and its slate of rather inoffensive yet insipid hosts was doing little to appease these concerns. But was there a place for that style? One man would argue so. I'm here in London to interview Meatloaf, and I, I think this is where he's staying. Excuse me, is this where Meatloaf's staying? Yes, he is, sir. Thanks very much. See you in a minute. This is James Corden. For British people, and maybe some in the blast radius as well, James Corden has long existed as a public figure before his move across the pond. Born in 1978, Jim Bob over here began an ascent through media relatively early on in life, after appearing in musicals, adverts, and TV in the late 90s, a supporting role in the comedy series Bat Friends provided his media career with significant momentum. The success of this series was then followed up by the even more popular TV show Gavin and Stacey, which saw Corden not just as a prominent character, but also as a writer and producer alongside Ruth Jones. The sitcom garnered critical and audience acclaim at the time and has since become a national treasure to many, cementing Corden's status as a household name. But was this always a compliment? Ruth Jones can't be here tonight, um, uh, and she's very, very sorry, and she really would, would love to. Sorry? Although there was little doubt that he was a highly decorated actor and writer with far more accolades than most by the time he turned 30, public reception to him as a person could be described as lukewarm to say the least. Long before gossip forums were all the rage, you could still find a thread of people just taking solace in how much they despised him. Part of that annoyance was likely inertia at his omnipresence, with countless projects and shows continuing to feature him. But there was also another aspect of him that people just found intolerable, with many not trusting what they felt was a rather forced, outgoing, happy-go-lucky persona. An interviewer writing for the Guardian acknowledged that when his name is brought up, many provide the opinion that he is, quote, and I mean, quote, arrogant and loud, his humor laddish and dated, that he is an unappealing, thespy air of entitlement. Also, most essentially, he's attention seeking. <laughs> Not exactly glowing praise. And although interviews often did present a more human portrait, that's not what many people saw as the public figure. Therefore, it may have surprised some when in 2014, rumors began to circulate that he was being tipped for one of the coveted late night TV slots on American airwaves. As mentioned, late night TV almost entirely runs on the charisma of its host, and their presentation as a down to earth anchor who can provide relevant commentary on issues that interest viewers. Up to this point, that was one thing that James Corden barely ever did. Other than the panel show, Elite 
League of their own, all his recognition within the United Kingdom came from his performative ventures. Yet in spite of this record and his divisive public persona, he decided to take the plunge, an attempt to flourish where many had floundered. What were the results? So we all had our, you know, clapping faces ready and the strangest thing. <laughs> Well, at a cursory glance, James Corden's late-night career was a resounding success. Lasting for nine seasons and airing over 1,000 episodes, he rubbed shoulders with a variety of celebrity guests and staged recurring segments that garnered a viral reputation online. With the retirement of the show in 2023 to spend more time with his family, Corden can likely look back at his late-night pursuit with some degree of fondness. He's allowed to. Nevertheless, behind the facade of a life well lived was also a death that few grieved, with the network deciding against replenishing the show after his departure. Was it simply that none could follow in his footsteps, or were the shoes that he left behind just too worn? So anodes, cathodes, and all other electrolytes, I suggest we take a closer look at James Corden's American dream and the late night lament it represents. If you're ready, then we'll proceed forth. I hope you enjoy. February 23rd, 2024. Ten days since I was called in to solve the mysterious disappearance of Big Charlie Bravo's 740 bucks. An array of suspects, some big, some small, all of them dirty. This money must have touched about a thousand hands before it got through here. It's like trying to keep your blinkers on Harry Houdini. These streets ain't singing. These curbs, they ain't even crooning. Not a chirp out the stool pigeons. Old Loose Lips Tallulah got cold feet over this one, and she'd be singing like a canary by now. Sorry, Lefty. You're on your own. All my hopes now lie on my old pal, Righty. What you got for me, Righty? Give me the rap. It's a tough one, old friend, but I may just have the solution. Paging you the details right now. Rocket money? Or as we like to call it over in Blighty, Rocket Money. Rocket Mo- Wait, that's the same thing. Rocket Money is the personal finance app that helps you cancel subscriptions, lower bills, and manage your money better. It will successfully trace and identify subscriptions and assist you in cancelling all unwanted ones with just a couple taps. No more having to use those pesky old phones to call up the companies. And Rocket Money does more than just that. It will analyze your spending habits and engineer a personal budget that accommodates your lifestyle while ensuring that you live within your means. They'll even notify you when you've exceeded your limits. And how much does this rocket money help the average Charlie Bravo? Rocket money has helped its customers save an average of, say, $740 a year, with over $500 million in cancelled subscriptions, if that means anything to you, old friend. Yeah, yeah, it does. Uh, I think I might have just solved the case, actually. Thank you, Righty. And thank you, Rocket Money. Now, I better get a wiggle on. Join the over 5 million members using Rocket Money today by going to rocketmoney.com slash the right opinion or clicking the link in the description to get started for free or to sign up for a premium membership. That's rocketmoney.com slash the right opinion. Back to the video. To understand the thesis of my video today, we're going to go right back to the start. Welcome to the Late Late Show, everybody. No, not just of James Corden. I mean of late night talk shows as a whole. Good evening, play lovers. Tonight's drama comes to you through the courtesy of Lipman Throat Syrup, the only syrup that contains 90% fish paste. Listen to a satisfied customer. Ugh. It may not necessarily surprise you that late night talk shows originated from radio, particularly given the degree that they often rely on tropes that wouldn't be out of place on other airwaves. Talk shows as a whole had been a dominant genre on radio for much of the contraption's own lifespan, with a plethora of celebrity hosts making their name on the transistor. Let's take a look at the man who designed the world's leading officer, Mr. Frank Lloyd Wright. Mr. Wright. Mr. Williams. This is Mr. Tennessee Williams, the famous playwright. Now, Mr. Wright, let's look at this here. I'd like to discuss it and explain to us what it do and what it can do. 
that other theaters couldn't do. In the late 40s and early 50s, there were a sprinkling of chat shows taking up the late night slots over the US. It's interesting to note that the first person credited on many online sources with hosting a talk show in the late night medium was actress Faye Emerson on a self-titled show from 1949. Now, of course, this existed under different circumstances, but it's still amusing and somewhat concerning to think that women had a greater late night presence in 1950 than they do today. Her background in acting, but also journalism and politics created a good combination for a talk show host, even interviewing Stalin in 1946. Quite a significant background on the cusp of the Cold War era. All I'll say is, how many modern late night hosts can say they interviewed Putin? It was Steve Allen, though, who in 1954 established many of the conventions that are associated with late night as we know it. This took the previous blueprints and combined it with audience participation, interview sketches, and musical acts. The other difference was that unlike previous attempts to fill the late night transmission, this one was a massive hit and set the ball rolling for what would be decades of enjoyed success for an arrangement that was to become as quintessentially American as a bald eagle tucking into a delicious apple pie. The apple pie technically comes from England, and bald eagles are carnivores. But I digress. Here's Johnny! Probably the most successful manifestation of this framework, though, was NBC's Johnny Carson Show, which ran for a whopping 30 years from 62 to 92 and produced over 6,500 episodes. At the peak of its popularity, the Johnny Carson Show was the most profitable broadcast on television, producing a turnover of what would be the modern equivalent in surplus of 200 million. Carson himself was a steady anchor, a sharp-witted comedian, but also a cutthroat interviewer who would not waste time meandering around subjects with celebrities if they didn't interest him. His success and his influence indirectly inspired the launch of many other shows from around this time, including Saturday Night Live in 1975, so you have him to thank or curse for that. There was one subject that Johnny Carson often actively opted to avoid though, and that was the hot potato of politics. In spite of reported encouragement from his personnel and his occasional featuring of political figures and sketches, he would typically choose to steer clear of discussing his personal political inclinations, out of fear that it would alienate echelons of his audience. And we've had some criticism on the show. Some critics over the years says, well, the show has no great sociological value. It's not controversial. It's not deep. The Tonight Show basically is um, to amuse people. Back then, the avoidance of politics seemed an essential ingredient to the recipe for the late-night success that Carson saw. But this would soon be flipped on its head with the introduction of other dominant figures in this landscape. Our first guest is an old friend of ours who is going to become the new host of The Tonight Show, May 22nd of 1992. And here he is, Jay Leno. Jay! <laughs> Following the retirement of Carson came Letterman and Lino, both of whom wanted Carson's slot after he stood down, with the latter being chosen. In response, Letterman moved from NBC to CBS and launched his own late show, which caused an over-decade-long ratings war between the two hosts. Letterman was more partial to integrating politics and discussion of such subjects, but it was still more of a side piece for a majority of its existence. This began to change, however, in the late 90s with the appointment of comedian Jon Stewart to host Comedy Central's Late Night Daily Show. At the time, The Daily Show was centered around comedy and social issues. Stewart took the format and made it overtly political, allowing comedy to provide more commentary on the state of the world. Silencing a comedian doesn't qualify you to be president of Egypt. Just president of NBC, I mean. <laughs> Woo! I gotta tell you something. Talk about a once proud empire. Stewart's star in The Daily Show's sharp writing proved to be a large rating success, even squaring off with Stewart in the ratings battle with Letterman and Lena, while also playing a significant part in launching the careers of other overtly political TV hosts such as Stephen Colbert and John Oliver, both now prominent figures in their own rights. The late night pivot towards politics persisted over the 2000s, with the appointment of hosts who were more than comfortable to take on potentially divisive issues. And by the time 2010 came around, politics was seen as a more necessary aspect to nearly every late night show's content. Nevertheless, it wasn't everything. Hosts still needed to possess characteristics that networks found demographically appealing, with the early 2010s in particular seeing a large turnover of personnel, the old guard departing to make way for younger, more digitally marketable individuals such as Colbert, Oliver, and Kimmel. Nevertheless, there was one more veteran who decided to step down at this time, that being the Scottish Late Late Show host, Craig Ferguson. What the hell is going on? I don't know, it's some mysterious stranger that all the ladies are cock-a-hoop about. <laughs> Is that right? They're cock-a-hoop? Yeah. You, you ever tried that? Yeah, many times. Sure, yeah. Yeah, boy, we're off to a good start here, folks. 
<laughs> it's a real rib tickler tonight, isn't you, it? You know. Is it. a rib tickler a sex thing? It can be, yeah. Okay. Can. Although not likely remembered by so many outside his genre today, Craig Ferguson was by many accounts a unique host on the late night circuit, taking the formula and leaning into more absurd ideas. He had a gay robot mascot, a pantomime horse, and a variety of gags and gimmicks he would integrate into his show. He had the capacity to be political, even winning a Peabody Award in 2009 for his coverage on apartheid in South Africa, but often opted for comedy, sketches, and interactions with celebrities and audience members that seemed to promote camaraderie between himself and those around him. In essence, he seemed like a very personal fellow who you'd want to have a pint with. Following his announcement to step down in 2014, there were a slew of people who were tipped to be suitable successors, from Neil Patrick Harris to Norm MacDonald, though I think that was just a joke. However, always building up to an August 5th announcement from CBS executives that would flip expectations upside down once more. James Corden? On the surface, it was pretty hard to see how someone like James Corden was a suitable successor to the likes of Craig Ferguson, whereas Ferguson's style was built on said Toad's natural likability. One of the public's greatest reservations about Corden in general was his lack of intrinsic charm and contrivance as a media personality. There was little doubt that he was a talented creative, but was he really someone you wanted to sit down with or watch on the TV? Citizens of Britain would probably say no. But this wasn't Britain, this was America, land of the free and home of the brave, where Corden didn't possess the celebrity status that he did in Blighty. And that may have been part of the appeal to him. I've been thinking about ending it all, to be honest. Suicide. What? Big time. How many Nurofen would I need to finish me off? You? You'd need hundreds. <sighs> can't afford that, can I? Not if I'm gonna have an holiday this year. The truth was that James Corden did garner fame at a relatively young age, and he'd always spoken in interviews about how he was aware that such status had the tendency to go to his head, and his susceptibility to partake in unhealthy habits or behaviours. If he attempted to become a late-night host in the UK, with people's preconceived notions of him, it may have struggled to take off. But with the US, a population of people still relatively ignorant to his reputation, he had the potential to start with a much cleaner slate and the life lessons that he had learned by the time he was in his mid-30s. So this seemed like the right sort of move for Corden. But this doesn't really explain why he was the first choice of the network when his name wasn't even on the radar of many American viewers. Well, maybe the idea of change is what had spurred studios on. Hi, I'm Jimmy Kimmel. And I'm Jimmy Fallon. And some people think I'm Jimmy Kimmel. And some people think I'm Jimmy Fallon. It was no secret that by this point, Late Night had become a bit of an old boys club, where main promotions only really came from inside. This wasn't exactly a surprise, because studios would obviously feel more secure promoting people who had some experience under their belt. And featuring prospective hosts on already established Late Night shows provided them with the capacity to assess their suitability as a future host. At the same time, it also made the pool of candidates and the framework that they had to work off much more restricted. If you only retest really someone in a specific format, you can never truly grasp the potential another candidate may have outside of that. James Corden was that other a candidate, established in his own scene but new to this one, with a style unknown but potential possibly untapped. It was also likely considered that the criticisms that many British people may have against him may also be what makes him endearing elsewhere. The loud persona that many in the UK found garish and tasteless may be just what appeals to those in a country that is inherently much more ostentatious. Ferguson was a great host for his time, but his ratings, like many TV hosts, had fallen over the years. With no front runners for the show and an industry experiencing a bit of a crisis of inspiration, it was perfect time for a gamble. Nevertheless, as Lily Singh showed, simply choosing someone different isn't enough. You have to do something different as well to really capture the imagination of prospective viewers. And with the launch set for 2015, they didn't really have too much time to come up with something revolutionary. So they didn't. Well, not really. Well, as the launch approached, it was reported that James Corden would be undertaking a style somewhat new to late night in the US, but not over here. Now you, Grant, when you talk about your co-stars, you're quite open about talking about your co-stars. I don't remember, you, you gave an interview to Elle magazine, and they asked you about your various leading ladies. Do you remember some of the things you said about them? This is Graham Norton, once again a rather prominent figure in the UK, but with a limited exposure outside the British Isles. He hosts the Graham Norton Show every Friday night, and has been doing so for 31 seasons since the late 2000s. His staff features a more informal interpretation of late night, with guests joining him on a couch to talk about a variety of affairs, play a game or two, and just share some banter. The significance of this style is that it allows for more back and forth between celebrities and their hosts. Whereas many US shows bring out the guests in sequential fashion and have an at least somewhat organized conversation, the direction that Norton's shows can go in is sometimes as planned to him as it is to his viewers. So in February of 2015, when James Corden sat down for an interview with Time magazine and flatly admitted that he didn't really have any plans for the show, that was all right. 
Additionally, he revealed that there would be a more theatrical element. This also made sense as, unlike many of his contemporaries, James Corden was much more a performer than a stand-up comedian or a rigorous interviewer. One thing that was never in doubt was Corden's versatility, and reading these interviews, a compelling case was being built for his tenure as the host of The Late Late Show. This was genuinely going to be a breath of fresh air. Hello, I'm James Corden. This is the offices of The Late Late Show, and this is our YouTube channel. Please like and subscribe. There's no way that's a real laugh. Please like and subscribe, and I promise you'll be rewarded. Just over a month before the show premiered, James Corden posted a simple 20 second video to a YouTube channel named for the show. It was humble in its nature, did not feature any previews, just a man sitting in a writer's room. It successfully exuded an air of modesty while also establishing another motive for his selection, and perhaps even the direction of the show digital content. Craig Ferguson had never been a viral figure on YouTube, nor did he have the online draw of many of his contemporaries. In an era where younger generations were increasingly on social media, the motive to convert some of those netizens into consumers of late night was becoming more necessary than ever. And with this simple video, The Late Late Show made a statement that they were joining the race for those potential new viewers. At the same time, there were still concerns as to the performance of a show that hadn't really been tested on the current generation of viewers. If you saw two guests on the stage on a US talk show, you were normally expecting some sort of conflict to ensue. There were reports that producers weren't entirely confident how audiences and even celebrities would take to the impromptu style when many of them are used to a much more rehearsed format. Did viewers really care about the notion of a colloquial approach to the talk show, or was the organization what made it appealing in the first place? Were certain celebrities ready to share the sofa and the limelight with the comrades in an era of media narcissism? Well, there was only one way to find out. Welcome to the Late Late Show, everybody. <laughs> By putting the damn show on air. After a few more previews, James Corden made his late night debut on March the 23rd, 2015. Hello, everyone. Uh, I know what you're thinking. You're like, oh, look, Andy Richter's got his own show. <laughs> <laughs> Early content demonstrated that what The Late Late Show was trying to do wasn't too out of the ordinary. It still demonstrated the trademarks of many other competitors. There was an opening monologue, interviews, and comedy sketches. However, Corden didn't hesitate to put his showmanship on display, whether that meant performing a sketch or a musical number. These were all reasonably tried and tested measures of a late show, though, that most producers could direct to a reasonable competency. What about that which was planned to set Corden apart? How would that be handled? Yes. How? No, are, are you married? Did you get married? Have you got married? I don't know. Maybe. Oh, sh come on. <laughs> no one's maybe got married. You've either got married or you haven't got married. Have you got well, married? Maybe. Well, that's a yes as far as I'm concerned. Did you get married? <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> Let me look at your hand. Boy. Oh, you got married. Yeah. They got married, everybody. Oh, my God. The new interview format appeared to work rather well, with the guests of Myla Kunis and Tom Hanks both sharing a warm chemistry with Corden. Commenters seemed to note how much more naturally the conversation flowed under the milieu of an open set. The topics moved rather seamlessly from one subject to the next, and never provide the impression that there is a set agenda for their appearance, even when they're there on promotional business. For many viewers, it was nice to feel they weren't just being sold something. But what about James himself? How did he adapt to this stuff? I really couldn't be more honored to be stood here talking to you now and believe me however shocked you are that i am doing this job you will never be as shocked as i am james is aware of how many people were shocked as to his appointment as the host of the late late show and takes note of this in his opening monologue admitting his surprise as well while also expressing a deep gratitude and reverence for those who had helped him into this role and his predecessor craig ferguson Another sketch harps on this too, James Corden's journey to The Late Late Show, which features a Charlie in the Chocolate Factory spoof and a training montage featuring a variety of other famous names, including aforementioned industry stalwart Jay Leno. The sketch also seems to take shots at the manufactured nature of many late night hosts and James himself, who is presented as the fish out of water in the industry. So, who are we gonna pick? We'll do it the way we've always done it. Chosen to host the Late Late Show. Please report to the School of Training. A few months back, we spoke about Lily Singh and her plans to tear up the late night circuit as we know, but was partly undone by the mishandling of producers and writers who didn't understand how to approach her landmark tenure, either being too heavy handed or just insulting. James Corden was not particularly revolutionary on the surface. He wasn't the first really in any category outside of the first late night host from High Wycombe, but he successfully presented himself as the underdog, while also not being afraid to have a laugh about it himself. The interview format allowed him to have a more relaxed camaraderie with his guests, and one that made him seem more down to earth as well. There there was one thing that Corden wanted to carry on from the Craig Ferguson era, it was that ability to make the audience feel that they were on the same level as him and his guests. The people's late night host per se. 
In this instance, James Corden's relative obscurity within the American market played to his advantages. As a flashy reputation didn't necessarily precede him, when you saw him involving his family, it felt sincere, as opposed to some hosts where that sort of decision may come across as contrived. The stardom of those around him allowed him to take a more passive role in content. Even though this was his self-titled show, you got the feeling that he was more than happy to be a passenger to the numerous celebrity guests and cameos that would often have the audience swooping. Here's the thing, Will, Will is a guy you want on your team because Will is willing to do the dirt work. He's the guy that'll secretly tell you in your ear, like, hey, I got six files. I'm not afraid to use them. <laughs> he's, he's that guy, right? He's, I'm he's, this guy. <laughs> that's it right there. The pick master. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's Pass it to me, Pat. No. No. Pick. I'll set a pick, screen. Pick. <laughs> I just I set a lot of screens. Set a lot. This is completely different to the perceived attention hungry James Corden that many elsewhere were used to. And although he still employed many of his histrionic talents, he was also not afraid to step back and give the space for other stars to shine. The contrast between the image he established in the UK and what he was presenting in the US was quite striking, but audience appeared to be buying it. However, the volume of viewers would always be the top of the priority list for CBS executives, and all the positive response from crowds and critics alike would mean very little if it didn't convert into actual numbers. So, what did the numbers actually say? Well, that this venture was at least a modest success, returning ratings of 1.66 million viewers in total. Now, on one hand, some would be quite pleased with this, given this was the highest ratings the show had seen in over three years with Craig Ferguson's host. At the same time, you'd expect the numbers to be higher for a show premiere, particularly one that received the level of hype that James Corden's did. Ferguson had been hosting since 2005, meaning that the majority of his tenure still secured higher ratings than James Corden's first show. And after Corden's premiere, ratings tended to settle at a similar number as his predecessor. This might yield one to wonder whether there was some sweaty palms in the boardroom, but Corden had one statistic that was all in his favor, the YouTube views. As noted earlier, as popular as Craig Ferguson's show may have been with certain audiences, he was never able to achieve numbers on YouTube, with only 25,000 subscribers on his channel by the end of his incumbency. This was partially because the most successful content on YouTube at that time, comedy sketches, weren't really a standalone part of his show. In eight days, though, James Corden had already surpassed 100,000 followers on the channel, with his sketch alongside Tom Hanks exceeding 10 million views. For a late, late night show, these were exceptional numbers from the off that seemed to reflect the pitch perfection of Corden's casting and format. Although it was still early days and such a program could not be defined overnight, James Corden appeared to have successfully rebranded himself as a host for the digital era, and brought life to a genre that had played it quite safe for the last decade with a show that tonally stood out from many competitors that seemed much more orchestrated. For the moment, James Corden was the flavor of the month. Would that translate into long-term success that he and his producers were looking for? Well, that wasn't just dependent on the success of the YouTube channel, but a greater plan that extended beyond cute sketches with celebrities. Let's talk about it then. In the first few months, although James Corden's network ratings weren't exactly anything to write home about, his YouTube statistics were, as he passed various milestones at breakneck pace, and released a flurry of content that went viral on the video sharing platform, the most notable one being a series called Carpool Karaoke, which often featured him sitting down with a well-known singer and performing a few of their hits over background music, though they sometimes mixed up with a person who's not necessarily known for their renditions to different outcomes. Hey there. I hear you're here for a 145 tour, and uh I have a little time on my hands, so you wanna go for a spin? Now, YouTube's success is obviously desirable for many TV networks and hosts alike, but if YouTube was all that mattered, then there wouldn't be such a thing as late night anymore. The truth was that James Corden's slot wasn't the most popular for younger audiences. Like many late night hosts from around that time, the median age of viewers was between 50 and 60. And although that wasn't inherently bad, they had to match the fall off of older viewers with the uptake of younger ones. With a more youthful demographic, YouTube was a platform that possessed the potential to enable that. It would be wonderful if a few of those viewers moved over to their TV sets. I spoke earlier about how I think inertia played a role in James Corden's public perception throughout the UK, how it probably made people more predisposed to view him negatively, the fact that he did take up a lot of gigs. Although his star was more well suited to the US, I think overexposure is a human problem, and if you see too much of one person unless you really love them, then you're probably going to grow sick of seeing their face and hearing their voice. Corden liked to keep himself busy, even filming a league of their own while hosting the late, late show, but he didn't stop there. I blacked out a little bit. Have I, have I ruined it? I've ruined it, haven't I? I've ruined the Tonys. While stateside, he began to look towards other work elsewhere, as he was touted for a variety of roles during his late night tenure. Once again, not a bad thing on the surface. And his roles hosting the Grammy and Tony Awards both seemed to go pretty smoothly, but his performative choices outside of these raised a few eyebrows. You even smell like a polar bear. Me? 
I smell like macaroni and sweet vermouth. Now, go and get that part! Many of these appear to be for animated films. These included Trolls, Nor the North, that awful interpretation of Peter Rabbit, and the Emoji Movie. It's really hard to talk about the motive behind his appearance in these films. Maybe his agents hated him too. But for someone with such a thespian background, they didn't exactly enshrine his status in the US amongst the greats. A majority of people don't necessarily judge an actor by their filmography. Ultimately, it's a matter of perspective. And at least the Emoji Movie put Corden and his old rival, Sir Patrick Stewart, back on the same team for once. And look at him talking about it. He seems real enthusiastic about the release of this masterpiece. I wanted to be part of the Emoji movie because uh, it, it, once I really read the story, I sort of thought it sounded quite a charming tale of, uh, of these things that you use in your life all the time. The notion that they might have a personality or something at stake or something to lose or real friendships just felt very fun to me. Maybe the point was that he wasn't trying to take himself too seriously as a host. And when you've got hundreds of episodes of your talk show to record, you don't want to be taking roles that are excessively intensive and demanding. At the same time, for someone who was trying to market themselves to a younger audience, these appearances kind of felt like a rather ham-fisted attempt to do so, if they even were. Some of these films were relentlessly mocked on YouTube as targeting stereotypes of young people rather than the actual young people themselves, with two of these already acquiring infamous meme status, which is almost an impressive ratio for James, though not a flattering one. Further to this, back on the stage, there were a few cracks starting to appear in the persona that he had constructed previously for his audiences. Name two of the cameramen in this room. <laughs> that, is, that is a great question. It's a, it's a different crew tonight, actually. <laughs> On the one hand, it would be hard to really give him too much flack for these moments given that it is one hell of a schedule, and many did not. After all, he had to drink a fish smoothie because of it. However, one can't help but wonder whether his predecessor would have been taking a swig from the cocktail glass. If Corn was really as down to earth as he liked to purport to be, how could he not name two cameramen on his set? Likely people he had been working with for a fair amount of time by early 2016. His audience reviews weren't exactly laudatory either, with many stating that although they enjoyed the show, they found his off-air behavior rather unappealing. There are a few celebrities reviews that characterized him as somewhat unpleasant, though most just found the audience experience rather distant from the actual show. None of this is standalone proof of anything unbecoming of the man, and none of it really resulted in any great controversy, but I think it represented a conflict in the image that James Corden wanted to build on air, and his own public image as an individual which was becoming increasingly intertwined with off-air judgments. As had occurred in the UK, where his exposure increased, online posts and articles began to circulate once more that maybe were a little critical of his demeanor and skeptical of his nature. James Corden entered the US late night as a somewhat unknown figure. As I noted, it played to his advantage as he often allowed his guests to shine and gave him a fresh start to re-establish his image as the amicable presenter who could bring audiences up to his and his celebrity visitors' level. However, when you host such a high-profile show, you can't remain unknown for that long. And as time passed, James Corden's understated profile began to evolve a little more into that of your standard Hollywood star. This wasn't an inherently bad thing, but he still had to retain what grounded him as a late night host, that modest likability. The brutal truth was that many people just didn't want to hear that much from James Corden himself. His opening takes were structurally sound, but they didn't have the appeal of his original monologues. His singing was good, but there was a reason why he was carpooling with many other more famous vocalists. His acting was strong, but he'd still often perform sketches with celebrity cameos. James Corden was a jack of all trades, and that was a talent in itself that lent itself to a lot of good content, but even with the name attached to a show, he was still a second secondary character. You'd think that was why they chose him. Just kidding, the presidential election happened last night and the good news is it's over now and everyone agrees with the outcome. <laughs> How would he navigate the evolving landscape and the potential challenges that came with it? Now, distaste for James Corden was nothing new, and it had never stifled him in the past. The truth was that most people who consumed his content over the TV would never know much about the murmurings that occurred online, nor would they care. However, with the internet becoming instrumental in James Corden's viral success, that buffer between Corden, his fans, and his detractors was gradually narrowing. And if he wasn't at least somewhat conscious to that, then he could very easily stray into territory that affected his success on a platform which was one of its main sources. 
He wasn't just a late night TV host anymore, James Corden was a YouTuber. Yet in spite of the viral success on social media, by the end of 2015, Corden had only managed to slightly enhance the under 50 patronage on the network ratings. Though, to be fair to him, statistics would tell you that it was a challenging year for a lot of hosts. The simple fact was that most people were turning off their late night in favor of other ways to spend their time. And there was an exception to this rule. Yes, you see, while James Corden was trying to win over the millennials with some goofball humor, something else was brewing, something that could have stood to overturn everything that Corden was constructing. And we're going to have a lot of fun tonight. As you know, I spoke about politics earlier and its increasing prominence within the late night sphere. While in 2015, a little known businessman as Donald Trump sent shockwaves around the political world when he announced that he was running for president. Taking over from David Letterman in September 2015, and with a somewhat political background himself, TV host Stephen Colbert was the first to really harness this news effectively, providing running commentary and even interviewing the then Republican prospective candidate. Immediately electrifying his network ratings, including those of the under 50s, he also provided narratives on various other political affairs and controversies, drawing in viewers with his often frank and biting narrative style, taking a significant chunk out of other political programs like The Daily Show. This was particularly viable given that Jon Stewart had relinquished his political monopoly the year prior, and although his successor Trevor Noah was no rookie by any means, he simply couldn't immediately recuperate Stewart's years of background that established him, or compete with the backing of someone like Colbert, who had worked with Stewart as well, and even had Stewart feature in an opening monologue. Nevertheless, the message was clear. Politics was anyone's game now. Seeing this, networks and producers alike likely flocked to have each of their hosts emulate the style in their own way. Now, Corden wasn't quite poised to do what Colbert was doing, nor did he want to. He didn't want to distract from the MO of his show. The truth was that viral YouTube content was still important. With that said, the success of the likes of Trump and Colbert did mark the beginning of something a bit more influential for the internet as a whole, a cultural movement. Up to this point, the most prominent internet figures have been entertainers. Many of the lunch YouTubers themselves were comedians and gamers, people whose content was not inherently heavy duty. This provided fertile grounds for late night hosts who specialized in that genre people like James Corden, and when he took the helm, there was no reason to focus greatly on politics, because that was mostly left to people who were actually taking their jobs seriously. However, as the lines between entertainment and politics became increasingly blurred, people on social media became increasingly involved in the discourse around these affairs, and not too long after, communities devoted to providing commentary on a variety of issues began to spring up all over the internet. Would James refrain from wading in too deep? Well, An article today revealed that during a national security meeting last summer, Donald Trump said that he wanted to increase the number of America's nuclear weapons by tenfold. Tenfold. Trump would have gone higher than tenfold, but he ran out of fingers to count on. <laughs> I don't need to recap exactly what happened with Donald Trump's 2016 presidential run, nor what occurred over the years subsequent to his election, because I don't think there are many people watching this video who don't know what happened. Ultimately, his usage of social media platforms and comedians' usage of him as a punchline appeared to help him more than it hurt him. What is more interesting was this involvement and how it began to evolve the internet's attitude to celebrities as a whole, late night hosts included. Through that sex scandal, I realized. Wait a minute. I you want to get through, just to say sex scandal, Dave, you want to get through your whole life and not have the word sex scandal attached to your name. That's right. Yeah. That's right. You didn't make it. Did not make it. Mm -hmm. uh, and have no one to blame but myself. Yeah. Late night hosts were some of the most squeaky clean people when it came to reputation, particularly in an industry that was often swamped in debauchery. Some of the most famous hosts were quite public about their improper behavior and the ramifications of them. Yet in spite of this, few of them ever had their careers too marked by it. As a matter of fact, some networks probably quite liked it as it often served as a ratings booster. After all, the main role these people play is that of the entertainer. Nonetheless, now people were not just looking for comedy, but for commentary. And being a commentator comes with new responsibilities that being a comedian doesn't. And although James Corden never pertained to bestow great wisdom onto his viewers, he was pulled as the industry was towards one that was much more critical and skeptical towards celebrities as a whole, especially in the wake of numerous campaigns about the abuse of power. Corden, like nearly every other host around at the time, felt the need to provide his opinions on these matters. Although he was within his rights to, and was always a good draw for the ratings, it also bestowed a greater amount of responsibility onto him as a talk show host. No longer was he just trying to fill one niche, studios in their panic had seemingly requested him to move into the lane of what seemed to be the most successful move to draw views. So now we have Corden often performing a balancing act, trying to have that viral goofy content on YouTube, while also taking monologues and comedy back towards a more traditional style in an attempt to woo TV viewers over to their goggle boxes like Colbert did. Could this place the persona that Corden had constructed under great pressure whilst he had presented himself as a humble TV host? Well, as the years passed and James Corden's reputation remained broadly unbruised in spite of the criticisms and ill sentiments, he might have felt pretty comfortable even if his persona wasn't as sincere as he portrayed. It was entertainment after all. By historic standards, even with the occasional altercations, Corden was pretty mild as an American late night host goes. But those transgressions, no matter how old or how insignificant, would soon become people's reservations, as a spotlight was placed upon one famous name who many thought had transcended TV as a whole. I feel the love. 
and I send it back to you. Let's talk about her then. James Corden swaggered into 2020 with a similar style to the ones in the years prior. He was still appearing in films whose quality was bad to mediocre, though he had diversified his repertoire with recent roles in the live-action adaptation of Cats, another critical and box office smash. And to top it all off, he was still rubbing people the wrong way online. First in a clash with late-night writer Jack Allison, who stated on Twitter that Corden had turned up to a meeting for writers and attempted to advocate for lower wages, and second in a Reddit Ask Me Anything where he was sworn by people asking him if he truly was a massive prick. Although he may not have been up to much outside of his comfort zone, behind the scenes the landscape of his industry was about to change significantly with the demise of one of TV's most iconic hosts. Ellen, Ellen, Ellen. It's been a while since she was given any real attention online, and why should she? She has, after all, mostly moved on from those spaces. Nevertheless, it wasn't too long ago where she was one of the leading figures on American television and high society as a whole, building an empire off an age-old but ever-relevant message of being kind to one another. All I've ever wanted to do is make people feel good and laugh, and there is no greater feeling than when someone tells me that I've made their day better with my show, or that I've helped them get through a sickness or a hard time in their lives. This message worked in building an identity that millions of people tuned in every day to see and experience on TV, alongside a ton of viral content that was released online. Rumors had long circulated that Ellen was not very kind at all. As a matter of fact, some would have gone as far to say that she was mean. At the same time, these rumors never really garnered much traction outside specific circles, which had already reached a consensus on her. There have been plenty of allegations regarding celebrities all over the industry and how they're actually dicks, yet it never necessarily impeded them from finding work or success. Up until the point of YouTube and social media virality, TV shows operated much more control over the image they could portray to an audience, and so if they wanted to show a creator through the lens that they were a kind person, it wasn't too hard. The truth was that Ellen's show represented an arc of someone who was an underdog in an extremely competitive industry, and for many to see her succeed and all these kind things on TV was heartwarming enough to help many make it through their day. We already spoke about what was changing on YouTube, the greater moral onus on talk shows in general, and the draw towards more polarizing discussions on matters like Trump. This had already squeezed centrists like Ellen, whose kindness message was lost on those who didn't believe that they had any obligation to extend olive branches to people they genuinely believed to be reprehensible. This was an important observation to make because this increasingly prevalent perspective led many to assume that Ellen had ulterior selfish motives with the doctrine she promoted, and what happened next would only confirm that in their mind. Ellen DeGeneres feeling the heat as more employees, past and present from her show, say that they were working in a toxic environment. In 2020, a deluge of claims regarding inappropriate behavior and toxic workplace culture at Ellen's show emerged. And although she was seldom at the center of these claims, as the person whose face was attached to the space where much of this occurred, a large amount of the responsibility to the public fell onto her. Go back 10 years and her producers would have purged the wrongdoers without any great media for raw. But with the internet, these claims spread like wildfire and generated so much attention that she was compelled to address it on the show. Additionally, the attachment of further stories about her character played into this notion that there was a fundamental deception which enabled such an environment. And that she didn't practice what she preached on the program. Now, there was no proven relationship to her being outwardly nice or mean with these allegations, and to be frank, Ellen could have been the most pleasant person ever and still had a hand in enabling or not tackling workplace toxicity properly. The focus on her not being a nice person worked more from a narrative perspective in a lot of these articles, which often focused on certain incidents and negative experiences faced by people who had caught the wrong side of Ellen. Now, there were plenty of people who came out to bat for her and people who said that she was actually really nice. I don't think most of the people who had experiences with the embattled talk show host, positive or negative, ever had any grand motive to lie about their runs with Ellen. They may just have caught her on different days. The problem was that when she stood up on stage and promoted that be kind axiom, there weren't any exceptions, and many took that to heart when the reality of this sunk in. It was clear that the whole friendly host stick was on its way out in a space where people didn't want their faves fraternizing with an enemy, and were innately more distrustful of TV hosts and their personas in general, with many commentators driving this exact point home. Regardless of what you think, the workplace has been unraveled to be highly fucking toxic at The Ellen Show. To the point 
where even Ellen finally came out to apologize over this, I, I guess. Which, let's be fucking real, she's only apologizing after the fact that she's been fucking caught and spit roasted. A lot of content was produced on Ellen following her scandal, and it proved to be an extremely fertile source of discourse on YouTube. The nice lady who is actually mean is always a good spin. Nevertheless, every subject has a threshold for new information that can be discovered and shared, and eventually people began to move on. But with the premise of this revelation still appearing somewhat interesting, people began to move on to other TV personalities and the pre-existing material that surrounded them. That was bad news for one person in particular. James Corden was probably one of the first targets beyond Ellen. Outside of his loud personality, his stint on late night TV had been nearing six years. Even his most popular sketches were wearing out their welcome a little, and with his reputation amongst UK critics preceding him, many began to pick apart the personality that they were familiar with, and contrasting it with what they felt was a put-on persona for show and ratings. And as Ellen had shown before, that was normally a red flag of something more sinister. In the following years, further toxic workplace allegations emerged about other talk show hosts, but most didn't do much because people didn't really have too much to say about their actual character. This contrast between Ellen and, let's say, Kelly Clarkson or Jimmy Fallon showed how a personal link between pre-existing character judgment and confirmation of those judgments was integral to how incidents and allegations were interpreted. After my Ellen video dropped, I got a ton of requests to look into other celebrities and James Corden's name just kept on coming up. So I looked into it and found out that Katz wasn't even close to the worst thing he's done. Ellen's demise had verified this theory that if someone had a smiling face and the nature to be a little too nice, then they may just be a bit too nice for it to be believed. Once again, this wasn't constraining Corden exactly, but it definitely shone increased skepticism upon him and his style. The last thing he could afford to do now was to actually confirm those theories. And yet, he did. James Corden is probably one of the few people who was called out preemptively for being a person he hadn't exactly proved himself to even be yet. Partly due to Ellen, partly due to his past and general demeanor, many took a stab that behind the scenes he just wasn't the nicest person. James Corden's past did not define him in that moment, and a couple chance interactions and general behavior that put him out of step with a proportion of the British populace wasn't really definitive evidence either. But maybe they were onto something if James Corden's own accounts were anything to go by. If you read enough candid interviews on James Corden or read enough articles that talk about him outside of his showbiz life, you begin to realize that he doesn't really seem like a hateful or vitriolic person. He just doesn't seem outgoing in the way that many hosts are. And observing the evidence elsewhere, it made a lot of sense. Even his anecdotes on his TV show present him as a somewhat assertive or even abrasive individual. I, I said to my wife, I said, I'm gonna see how many times times I can go past Donald Trump and say you're the man Donald you're the man right <laughs> and so I did it like seven times no. yeah. in these stories this assertion was always presented in a context that at least justified this behavior or painted it in a comedic light at the same time when you have someone like that and integrate that into daily life it might give one pause to think that Corden on a bad day might make the choice to assert himself in the wrong place at the wrong time so, come 2022, with the show firmly into its seventh annum, James Corden made the announcement that he would be stepping down from the show in the following year. As said at the start, Corden cited family reasons, but the ratings had also not quite come to fruition like the network had properly hoped, with social media calling on his presence significantly. Outside the general unease at his personality, his continued appearance in poorly received films, and his casting into roles that seemed to have nothing to do with him, such as the Friends reunion, was causing some annoyance amongst even those mostly indifferent to his existence. However, as the credits kept rolling in, even as he was stepping down, James Corden had every reason to enjoy himself. And where else to enjoy himself than a fine dining establishment? When in New York, you have to check this iconic French brasserie. They serve breakfast through supper every day with brunch served on weekends. South of Houston Street in Manhattan is a French brasserie known as Balthazar. Owned by outspoken restaurateur Keith McNally, it has one other location in London and is well regarded for its French cuisine. 
Outside of its menu, it's also primarily known for its celebrity clientele, with many articles recommending it to those into citing such mythical beasts. One of these celebrity clients was James Corden, who had decided to visit on a couple of occasions. On the first, after his main course, Corden called towards the manager and pointed towards a hair that he said had been found in his food. A most unfortunate scenario. On the second, Corden was concerned that there was some egg white in his wife's egg yolk omelettes, and when the order was fixed and sent out again, it was sent with the wrong side. Obviously, in both of these cases, one has a right to flag up such an issue with the staff and have it sorted. Yet, on the 17th of October, McNally took to Instagram to formally announce that Corden had been banned from Balthazar due to his handling of these two incidents. Branding Corden a tiny cretin of a man, he recounts both instances where James repeatedly became verbally aggressive to staff in light of these incidents. The first time demanding that he be brought a free round of drinks and alluding to writing a nasty review on Yelp. The second time becoming very loud and unpleasant towards a server, implying that she couldn't do her job properly. Now, even these quotes have context. It may not quite accurately capture the tone or timbre that he was speaking with. At the same time, there was really no justification for such unpleasantness to a person who likely didn't have a hand in any of the errors that actually occurred, let alone to anyone who works in the restaurant. Those jobs are intensive and high stress. Mistakes are made from time to time. And although it's understandable that there could be frustration at certain missteps, you still need to channel that frustration with some level of respect to the fact that nobody there is trying to poison you. And their day may be going just as shitty as yours. The last thing they need is a patron growing hostile. Given the reports, it'd be a surprise if Gordon really was the most unpleasant customer that McNally had ever seated. But for someone as high profile as him, this Instagram post was the last thing he needed. And confirmation for many who'd hypothesized that this was exactly the sort of person he was. Distant, out of touch, but also just a bit of a prat who lacked empathy for the very people that he was trying to market to on his shows. Today, it was made clear to a lot of people that I was right all along. They're finding out what I've known since the beginning of time, that James Corden is an unentertaining asshole, whom is an absolute detriment to everything he's in. His presence makes the media that he infests worse. He is the worst part of the movies he is in. He is this miasma of unentertainment, the antithesis of fun. And today, he has been banned from a New York restaurant because he is a massive dickhead as well. As commentators quickly jumped onto it and other stories emerged, mission damage mitigation was immediately underway, with Manali posting a follow-up statement not too long after, stating that Corden had called him to apologize profusely, and that given that he'd fucked up his fair share in his time, he was a strong believer in second chances, so the ban was subsequently dropped. This didn't seem to change much of the narrative online, people were already not happy with Corden. But James Gordon, strangely enough, wasn't finished. Yes, because the same week that this had occurred, he was booked an interview with the New York Times to promote his upcoming TV series, Mammals. Yet, with the recent news still being hot off the press, it was going to be hard to avoid a conversation about the recent banning. There are many ways that Gordon could navigate that. How he did it is rather strange, though. Although stating no intent to go into details, he's clearly bothered by it, expressing that he did nothing wrong and that it's beneath him, the interviewer and the publication as well, appearing to go on a rather extended rant about something he insisted didn't matter to him. Additionally stating that if he lived on Twitter that Hillary Clinton was president and that Jeremy Corbyn was prime minister essentially implying that he is choosing not to engage with it. This obviously irritated McNally, who once again returned to Instagram, stating that following this development, he expected further apologies to the staff affected by Corden's conduct, being rather unambiguous in his terms of reigniting this fuel. James Corden's decision to double down after apologizing put him in a rather awkward position with his audience, and the attention that he was receiving was not favorable. How could he combat a narrative that had existed before he even confirmed it? Well... As some of you may have seen, uh, last week there were, there, was, there were stories about me being banned from a restaurant. Let's find out. Have I missed, have I missed anything? Did I miss any news? <laughs> I wish that was the case. On Monday the 25th of October, James Corden took to the Late Late Show once more to talk about the affairs that had occurred over the past week. But unlike other episodes, this time he was the main headline. And within light of the back and forth between him and McNally, he felt it shouldn't go unaddressed. Sitting behind a desk in a more traditional talk show setup, he dedicates five minutes before an ad break to tackling the elephant in the room. And at the time I considered tweeting about it or Instagramming about it. He opens by talking about his avoidance of discussing the topic, stating that he'd always adopted the never complain, never explain approach. Although this time he acknowledges that the situation is slightly different, alluding to the words of his father. Never complain, never explain is very much my motto. But as my dad pointed out to me on Saturday, 
He said, son, well, you did complain, so you might need to explain. Look, when you make a mistake, you've got to take responsibility. So I thought I would, if it's okay, I, I would share with you what happened. Next couple of minutes relate to his recounting the situation, explaining his position, that his wife has an allergy to one of the ingredients in the dish they prepared, while also noting his own shortcomings, stating that in the heat of the moment, he had made a choice comment that he now sincerely regretted. We sit down, we ordered, and my wife explained uh, that, that she has a, a serious food allergy, right? So when everybody's meals came, my wife was given the food that she was allergic to. As her meal came wrong to the table the third time, in the heat of the moment, I made, I made a sarcastic, rude comment, right, about cooking it myself. And it is a comment I deeply regret. Because I didn't shout or scream, like I didn't, get up out of my seat. I didn't call anyone names or use derogatory language. I've been walking around thinking that I hadn't done anything wrong, right? But the truth is, like I have, I made a rude, co rude comment and it was wrong. It was, it was an unnecessary comment. It was ungracious to the server. Corden's story diverged at least somewhat to the original manager's report. Corden denies ever having shouted or becoming overly enraged, which is why at first he felt that he had done nothing wrong whatsoever. In this context, though, it wasn't really presented as a defense of his actions, more as an explanation for why he didn't apologize sooner when many feel he should have. The other interesting detail that one could pick up on is his recall of the first incident, which he states occurred in 2014, something that wasn't expressed in McNally's original post, but I suppose explains the reference to Yelp. Last Monday, the owner of the restaurant had heard what happened and uh, he Instagrammed that I was banned from his restaurant for two offenses. One was a meal that I, I think was back in 2014 when I sent a dish back that had hair in it, and the other was last week. Corden also states that as soon as he heard about this situation, he called McNally to ensure there was no bad blood between them. It was just that by then it had grown into a media firestorm. There was nothing that Corden could do or say to make it right. As James reads some of the more amusing comments on the matter, he concludes with the hope that he can return to the restaurant and apologize in person as he really does love the place and the people there. I accept everybody's opinion. I also hate, as I said to the owner that day, that, uh, that I've ever upset anybody ever. It, it was never my intention. It just wasn't, and I love that restaurant. I love the staff there. I hope I'm allowed in again one day. So I'm, when I'm back in New York, I can go there and apologize in person, which is something I will absolutely do. Throughout the segment, he heaps praise onto the restaurant, calling it one of his favorite dining establishments amongst many other words of high regard. Corden also says that he never intended to upset anyone, that he knows how hard it is for those in the service industry, given that he had worked many jobs in them himself. These comments paired with the presence of his parents appear to be trying to evoke some notion of humanity in this scenario. Though it may come as a surprise to some, James Corden was indeed human. Nevertheless, many in the comments did not find his response satisfactory, with many criticizing jokes they felt were out of place or the insincerity of the fact that he had taken this long to yield a public apology. I don't entirely agree with these criticisms. I think this was a good time to address it. And I think if he'd taken it too seriously, it may have felt like a different brand of insincere, like overkill. However, I do think his position was somewhat compromised by the fact that he had already dismissed it publicly in an interview with the New York Times after apologizing in private and implied that people's opinions did not matter. I think this factor definitely irritated some people more than it would have otherwise. Yet there was one other person whose opinion mattered as well, the restaurateurs. What did McNally think? Well, in true McNally fashion, he once again accepted James Corden's apology and say that he had behaved much worse in the past without apologizing. So he was lifting Corden's ban and stating that he would be imposing one on himself in the next fortnight. A slightly bizarre, but no less hopefully satisfying conclusion to this saga for both parties. This was until three days later where another article was published on Corden in the Times, but this time the British Times. Titled James Corden, No One Ever Tells You How To Deal With Fame, it goes over a lot of Corden's career and some points we'll pick up on later. But most interestingly, it once more returns to the egg situation, quoting text from Corden sent to the interviewer stating, It's so odd, I never screamed at anyone. I didn't shout, didn't call anyone a name or swear or use derogatory language. How is it remotely a thing? We'll also say that Manali wasn't even at the restaurant that day, so how could he know what had occurred? A few days later, this made its way back to McNally, who once again posted another Instagram statement, accusing Corden of spreading lies about the situation and now branding his TV apology insincere. Although he doesn't explicitly state that he is banning Corden again, it feels safe to assume that he will not be welcomed back there again anytime soon. Now, to be fair, I think the texts themselves were quite possibly sent before for his televised statement, given how the interviewer framed them. In this case, it was the timing of the publication of this article that likely provoked McNally into responding once more. If there's one thing that you'll be able to glean about the guy is that he loves to talk. James Corden, banned, unbanned, rebanned, unbanned, rebanned.
That is impressive, but again, not very flattering. The personal nature of McNally and Corden's feud was overshadowed by the fact that the people who didn't like Corden had got what they needed. Confirmation that this was the sort of person that he was, and that in their mind this likely wasn't an isolated incident. His public response, although by no means the worst, almost fell victim to the circumstances that precipitated it. This perception that Corden's nice kind persona was an act, and that any response was going to pander to an audience's sensibilities because like every other episode of The Late Late Show, it's very highly strung. With Corden's late-night career coming to a conclusion, this incident may not have done anything to ultimately change his fate, but it certainly illuminated one of the reasons that he was moving on from this space. The environment had grown hostile to his type, and whether he had a point or not, there was very little he could do to change it. So with the finale of the show beckoning, no successor chosen, one can't help but posit. What now? You are going to be absolutely shocked at how we are going to end this show. Guess what? We're going to end with a song. I know! The Late Late Show with James Corden's finale aired on the 27th of April 2023. It featured Harry Styles and Will Ferrell as special guests, with additional appearances from late night hosts past and present. It was split into six chapters, each exploring the final farewell. On concept, it's not dissimilar to many curtain calls for these sorts of shows. At the same time, there was an aspect that set it apart. Many late show finales feel like a celebration of their host's time on stage. James Corden's felt more like a collective sigh of relief that he was finally able to leave all of this behind behind that he had completed this, the ordinary man who had achieved something extraordinary. I'm sure he wasn't the only person celebrating, but his departure also marked the end of something else, representative of a greater challenge facing late night and talk shows as a whole, and one that didn't seem to be going away. It's unfathomable why they took a chance on me to do this job, I will never understand it, but they have supported and they have loved this show, and I will be forever grateful for what they've done for me and my family it's been uh, it's been life changing as with his debut james corden uses the finale to explore the concept of his own late night stint with a degree of reverence and modesty this time though integrating behind the scenes clips that demonstrate the process building up to the conclusion of this prolific program it definitely evoked nostalgia from corden's audiences who had developed an emotional bond with the outgoing tv host they likely didn't alter many of the sentiments of those critical to him as every now and then another article would drop where someone would critique his character and analyze the controversies that occurred throughout his time in the states which by this point was a significant few it seems that many, Corden included, were in agreement. His time had come to move on from a space that had provided him with so many memories and exposed him to a new echelon of media and social media alike, for better and for worse. In the Times interview quoted earlier, Corden was asked what sort of plans he had after the show, and his response was unambiguous, not many. It seems that the past eight years had taken their toll, and the escalation of the Balthazar incident was just the confirmation he needed that he made the right decision. I do genuinely believe that part of the reason he quit was to spend more time with his family, but only really as a detox from what was an emotionally demanding job for someone who didn't always seem the best suited for it, but it still found a lot of success. In spite of the criticism, it was rumored that actually the network didn't want to let him go, with certain outlets reporting that he had been offered approximately £15 million to remain on air. Even if we were reluctant to admit it, James Corden had changed late night in a few ways that others had not been able to and may not be able to again. Setting up my ideas. Yes, you're leaving your show. We figure out who gets what. Okay, what does everybody want? Uh, carpool, carpool karaoke. karaoke. It'd be very easy to sit here and slag him off like a lot of people have. Explain why he actually failed in America. But the evidence indicates that there were fields that he genuinely excelled in. He became one of the first late night hosts whose success was largely dominated by online content. And his Carpool Karaoke series set a new benchmark for viral late night content to the point of launching its own series. The fact was that he created content identifiable enough to retain an audience of devotees, yet accessible enough to draw different audiences from all around the world on a virtual platform. That was credit to the creativity and the adaptability of the host and a team of highly committed crew members who deserve more recognition than they probably received. He had cracked something that many others had been able to do, and when a network has someone who can at least get one thing right, they of course wouldn't want to let them go. Although he addressed the Balthazar situation separately, his final episode was probably the most indirect response to the narrative, as it features him heavily fraternizing with his staff and other colleagues, working for that image as the talk shows every man once more. He also doesn't hesitate to take some pot shots at himself or the ill-advised tonal decisions such as the end of lockdown music musical whose irony was self-explanatory. Here was a TV show host who wasn't afraid to take the piss out of himself, but had done so rarely in the past few years. Making a song and dance every single night. I don't sing and dance every night. You do. It's been a lot. Like, 
a lot. That's, no, I did nearly two years without singing and dancing once. Yeah, but that was during COVID. And then as soon as COVID was over, you did a huge musical number with Ariana Grande about how COVID was over. Now, of course, those few clips wouldn't be enough to convince most critics of the person that James Corden is, that down-to-earth chap that the show often wanted to present him as. And in a way, they shouldn't, as any of that content can be competently contrived. Yet, if they wanted to go for something more like this throughout the show, it wouldn't have been that difficult. That last episode feels like a return to that, and the fish-out-of-water narrative that welcomed Corden onto many people's TV screens, but had faded over time. At the same time, in spite of all the praise that one could give James Corden, the final episode also represented something else, that missed opportunity. And I want to take this minute right now in prime time to thank everybody who has worked here on the show, this family, this team. I love you so much. I will miss you. Um, and I hope you're feeling as proud as I do at the show that we've created. And I thought we'd just take a minute tonight and take a look back at some of the great times we have had here at The Late Late Show. James Corden was a gamble for CBS. His selection was so unexpected, it was literally lampooned on the show that he subsequently hosted as a golden ticket process. At the same time, although executives could probably rejoice in the fact that his selection had its moments, the fact that with so many creative ideas, it had slumped back into a rather cookie-cutter model of what a late-night show could be was also a bit of a disappointment. Beyond recognition for YouTube success, Corn's approach didn't take networks closer to a late-night niche for this generation, let alone this decade. It was probably most reflected in the fact that even by the time this episode aired, there had been no successor announced. As a matter of fact, they seemed to be pivoting to a different sort of show altogether. Although Corden enjoyed success with standalone content posted on YouTube, he struggled to convert that into TV viewership, and it was reported that CBS were losing a lot of money because of it. There was still a question as to how new viewers could be drawn in to watch a whole episode rather than just the snippets and clips that were uploaded online. Corden didn't have an overarching appeal that set him apart for the greater sense, and it was hard to say that maybe he'll watch The Late Late Show for its esteemed host. Few would be able to describe what distinctive style or panache he possessed at the helm. Further to this, as the generational demographic shifted, so did his popularity. Corden may have performed well amongst old generations and even some millennials, which was great in 2015, but not so great come 2023, and his attempt to broach the generation gap ultimately seemed to fall short, even with the big names attached. As Alan showed that high, peppy, positive, theatrical content that Corden often indulged drew skepticism from much younger audiences who always felt it had to be indicative of something beneath the surface. But somehow this reached beyond the smiling faces and more into the digital realm whose expectations could not be predicted nor catered to a lot of the time, and the failure of studios to manage it as a whole. What am I talking about? Well, James Corden's show may have ended, but was it finished? As noted, when Corden stepped down from the Late Late Show, there was speculation about who the next host would be. It wasn't like there was an absence of candidates. However, in February 2023, a couple months before the Late Late Show's finale, reports began to circulate that it was going to be discontinued altogether, and CBS's radio silence on this matter as the months continued to pass only appeared to confirm this. Whereas Corden had been announced as the new host nearly a year before his tenure began, there was no sign of any popular names on TV taking the reins from the polarizing Brits. It all sent the same message. This was the end for the Late Late Show, and for some, it wasn't hard to see why. In the past decade alone, late-night advertising revenue had fallen from its peak of approximately $900 million in 2016 to less than $350 million in 2022. And although I'm sure none of us would turn down such an amount, you also couldn't ignore the sharp decline in profitability of such content which really should have been flourishing in an era where many people were increasingly in front of their screens. In November, it was announced that a revival of the internet-focused game show at midnight called After Midnight would take up the slot instead, effectively ending the occupation of a late-night talk show after 28 years. It's easy to see what CBS are going for with the revival of this show, but one can't help but feel that this is really just a repeat of the exact same problem that has plagued Late Night for a few years now. They just don't have a clue who they're trying to appeal to, and they think that simply referencing the internet will make people who are on the internet interested in what they have to say. This isn't, and I don't think has ever been the case. The new show will be much lower budget and feels like a network deciding that they've tried everything they're doing, so they're just going to throw in the towel. It feels rather defeatist, but maybe they weren't ever really trying. Hi, I'm Harry. I'm Niall. I'm Zane. I'm Liam. I'm Louis. And we're, we're One Direction. Direction. And we'll be watching The Late Late Show with James Corden featuring Reggie Watts. Starts March 23rd.
In 2015, when he was ushered onto the scene, James Corden was one of the youngest hosts on the circuit. Outside of being an outsider, it was also meant to bring a youthful perspective to a range of presenters who were mostly in their 40s and 50s. Dating back to the Craig Kilborn era, the Late Late Show had been more oriented for the younger viewer. And although that had fallen out of sight in the past few years, perhaps, with James Corden's appointment, this was clearly back on the agenda. Corden was presented as a protege to many of those who came before him, but also as an unknown presence. This gave him the opportunity to place his feet firmly in the new era of content and provide him with the potential for at least 10 years of late night television, likely more. His digital success proved that he had one component of the formula down, yet despite being perceived as a gamble by some, he was still an extremely safe choice by many standards. It was just that networks had become so used to cultivating hosts from within their business that putting faith in anyone outside their incubators seemed like a massive risk. For someone with the potential and the aptitude to create such viral content, Corden's history in the UK, which made him the long-term subject of media criticism and actual unnecessary hate, had numbed his enthusiasm for the internet, which was where many of the most outspoken voices would congregate. This was reflected on in the Times interview where Corden had asserted that he never reads the articles before reading an article and expressing visible agitation over it. Although his position was somewhat understandable, the inability to authentically engage with online content partially prevented him from breaking through with many of those younger than millennials. To be fair to Corden, he was hardly alone in this position. Most late night hosts chose to avoid engaging with social media, more approaching it from the perspective of a curious observer, yet always maintaining a distance, which is what leads to incidents like Paris Hilton and Jimmy Kimmel comparing pictures of apes. They hear what the big thing is and dip their toes in it without an actual pulse on how young people genuinely feel about it. No cap, Gen Z finds your whole simp vibe high key sus, but it's the attempt at reconciliation for me. Translation? One sketch I've always found interesting is Lily Sings, where she outwardly acknowledges the difference between millennial and Gen Z culture. It's a weird mishmash of everything right and wrong about how older people understand younger people, but in doing so, whether intentionally or not, successfully satirizes the attitude that late night hosts possess towards Gen Z, how they enjoy their media, and how they wish to be treated. There was a, a quote about a Gen Xers at uh, oh. magazine. Uh, Gen Zers, Gen Xers. Zers, sorry, I don't know, one of the letters. One of them. Now, Zoomers are summing up a lot of those feelings about millennials with a new viral term, chuggy. Yes, chuggy, which is a word to make fun of millennials and not as I originally thought, to describe what Brett Kavanaugh did with PJ and Squee. Late night hosts talk past young people. Their content is often presented under the guise that eventually they'll just grow into it. Yet we don't really know that to be true. Audiences are turning towards more niche and interesting formats like Bo Burnham and Eric Andre. Sketch meanings like Auntie Donna and Tim Robinson are landing large spots on streaming platforms with their absurd sketches. Even prominent creators on YouTube have their own individual draw which rate highly amongst the youth of today. Networks have had the opportunity time and time again to pick creators and creatives who have more affinity with the internet and bring them into the mainstream. But because they haven't come from that eternal process that has been so deeply trusted for decades now, I think there's always a hesitation to even consider them worthy of any late night presence. Leno, Letterman, Colbert, Conan, Oliver, Kimmel, Fallon, every single last one of them had some late night presence before their tenure at the helm of a late night show, and their appointment was often seen much more like a promotion than an entirely new position. Corden was the first departure from that trend in a while. Even Lily Singh, despite having an extremely mild sense of humor and diversifying what was a rather stale late night league of creators, could still be considered a risky choice. Her show was canceled after two seasons, despite many hosts needing much longer to find their feet. It's a sign of austerity in the face of adversity in an industry that should be thriving on creativity. The decision by many younger generations to not consume network TV the same way their parents did isn't a death note to networks they can't win them over or find some common ground. It's true that everyone's humor develops long into adulthood, and they may come around to the format that late night currently caters to, but not as it is right now. Much like elections where political parties feel the need to pursue policies that pander to an older voting population rather than asking how to create policies that might inspire young people to vote in the first place, networks seem too afraid to win over an audience which doesn't have a ratings presence, especially if it risks alienating the older populace they already possess. James Corden being one of the younger hosts on late night TV only really worked in the sense that the current cartel of presenters are pushing passe, and that his fate, regardless of the culture, had already been sealed by the time the internet found his backstory. But with that said, it wasn't just his past that defined his presence.
It's very easy to talk about the fall of talk shows when you only experience the present roster of content that seems to toe the line of mediocrity. Talk about how great something was when most people probably don't even remember it is only really useful for a thesis statement that you don't care to back up and a sense of nostalgia for an era that never actually existed. I sure as hell don't remember 20th century talk shows because I wasn't there. But thanks to YouTube, we do actually have a frame of reference for some of this content. And one thing that going over some of the oldest late night shows whose fragments have made their way online would tell you is that late night started out as a bit of a mess. We're going to be back. We have some more underwater trickery for you. I don't know exactly what's going to happen. I think Skitch Henderson is going to wrestle a 40-foot alligator or something. But we'll figure it out in just a second if you'll hurry right back. Shows like Broadway Open House and even pioneering hosts like Steve Allen tended to move rather formlessly between their acts, interviews, and antics. This wasn't a discredit to them and definitely retains a charm of its own. However, it's also the reason why there was much that could be refined in the coming decades, why certain hosts did just that and why they tend to hold up a bit better, particularly if you look at the statistics. Going over YouTube, a few former shows have recently found some decent coverage, but there's one that stands out, one that many would consider to be the most popular example. Johnny Carson. His late night show content has received a renaissance of sorts in the last decade since many of his interviews and content was re-uploaded. And although it doesn't exactly compete with Carpool Karaoke on the view count front, the content that was released decades before its traffic and growth have been impressive, and it's not particularly hard to see why. For comparison on YouTube, Carson's content has solidly outperformed most late night hosts who were pre-YouTube. Even if they are more recent, Letterman has a fraction of his views and Leno doesn't even have a channel for his content. Despite not having as many uploads as other contemporary YouTube channels, his mean views per video sit at a tidy 880,000, which is an average slightly less than Colbert in modern day terms. When you watch these clips that have accrued reasonable virality, it's not hard to see why people keep coming back to them. I miss that. Well, there's a big headline in one of these uh incredible magazines about the fact that I want to have a tenth child so my wife will have something to remember me by. I spoke briefly about Carson earlier, but there is something simply quite electric about a lot of his most popular clips, which signify what has allowed them to hold up so well. Outside of bringing on interesting guests, platforming talented and original comedians who had breathing room to act as they pleased, and not being afraid to have challenging conversations with high profile or difficult figures, Carson is an authentic host. Governor Reagan, uh, we can't decide between Mr. Ford and Mr. Rockefeller. We're divided. Would you like to uh, Would you like to go to the White House? You remember that answer I gave you about the CIA? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on, come on. No, no, I won't buy it. I'm not going to buy it. No, I, I can understand the yeah. CIA now, no. but... Uh, no, I... I just, thought that was delicately phrased. I, yes. <laughs> verbose but delicate. Yeah, verbose but delicate. <laughs> One of our more serious actors. Yes. <laughs> Olivier, yo. Yo. <laughs> when he makes a comment, there's no sign that he's playing the crowd. These conversations could be happening in his lounge as far as we're aware. And that style is assisted by an unmatched adaptability, being able to pivot from interviewing post-gubernatorial pre-presidential Ronald Reagan to multiple stints with Robin Williams to Merritt Heaton, who at the time of his interview was just an everyday guy known for working as a farmer at the age of 97. Each interview is underlined by Carson's steady interest, which shows a genuine knowledge for the subject that's being discussed, but also a curiosity to learn more. Do you still actively work on the farm? Yes, I honestly do. What? Yeah, I, I'm not far out from the last harvest we had, about yeah. 90 days. Uh-huh. Yeah. What kind of a typical day would you have? What, what time would you get up in the morning? Oh, you don't have to rush. Carson meets each guest at their level, but never dilutes their personality with his own. It's a balancing act that I'm quite in awe of, to be honest, and one that I don't think any host successfully pulls off today. There are plenty of things that one might look for at what makes some of these episodes so entertaining, but Carson's magic, in my opinion, was simply the fact that we didn't feel like we needed to know any more about him than what we saw on the show. He had his fair share of controversies, probably more than today's hosts. Some of them on air, but they never seemed to necessarily contradict the image that he portrayed there. His show didn't really have an agenda other than him finding out about people and sharing it with you, even when handling potentially prickly subjects. It was that lack of agenda that didn't just make it watchable for many, but entertaining in a way that humanized celebrities and figures who often only really existed in another world to the viewer. Carson brought a structure and identity to what was a budding genre, giving it a maturity that it had not experienced before. The problem is when it goes senile. This is, this is fun because yeah. this is what television is. You come out, it's right now spontaneous, and you give and you take, and some nights you're good, some nights you don't know what's going right. to happen. Movies I find kind of boring. You sit there and you have to do it over and over and over right. again. You and wait eight hours to do one It takes line. a lot of discipline. 
Since the end of Johnny Carson, it feels like Late Night has created an agenda within their shows, playing off blueprints that take a lot of inspiration from Carson's body of work, but without appreciating what made it so effective. It's the same issue with political content. Jon Stewart's success on The Daily Show, followed by even Colbert's use of it, possessed merits in their own rights, but also immediately inspired numerous copycats within competitors who were trying to keep up with the evolving zeitgeist. It creates a Frankenstein's monster of Late Night, which has all these moving parts of successful shows, but no actual independent identity themselves, to the point that it becomes a running joke that they're indistinguishable. And sure, fans of these shows will know what sets them apart, but is what sets them apart what draws you to them? It always feels like watching a bunch of guys who are trying to cajole you into liking them by appealing to what they think will catch your attention. Corden is like the boss battle of this manifestation in my mind, a performer who attempts to emulate the late night host style so ardently this artifice becomes apparent, and nobody has a clue who he even is as a person, because no matter what personal stories occur, you're always questioning the purpose because they appear to ingratiate their host. Hosts can tell you about their family and you might be endeared, but the moment they pretend to be excited for a film they may not even like or know about, the image of them cracks a little, and as much as James Corden can sell, he cannot sell, for example, being excited for a second-rate action movie that I'm sure most of the population hasn't even heard of, and he certainly can't sell that day in, day out. Very few people are that excited about life, especially James Corden. Which premieres on Netflix August 11th. We are very excited about this movie, Girl. I think it's going to be huge. Now, Thank this was you. several years in the making. I'm so excited. What do we need to know? What do we need to know about this film? Oof. Uh, well, how do I start? On the surface, it's easy to dismiss the issue that is facing the genre today as one of an industry played by celebrities who are simply not as interesting as they used to be, or a dying genre. And that may be true in some ways, particularly for those who are there to promote something. There's always a level of contrivance behind the conversation. At the same time, it's not like Corden hasn't hosted interesting people who have a lot to say or a lot to offer. John Cena, Zlatan Ibrahimovic, hell, even BTS. These are all individuals who could have spawned genuinely intriguing interactions. And in some way, they did. There are sparks every now and then, but it's just not consistent across every celebrity. The immortality of Carson comes from the fact that he allows a guest that space to create something fascinating, and that he is an interested person, and he can make it appear interesting. That lack of agenda. And you contrast that with James Corden, and it's so blatant there's something to be sold. Tomorrow, congratulations on... Well, I honestly think it's a, a, a masterpiece in filmmaking. All of the performances are incredible. It's such a beautifully made piece. I know that you're unbelievably proud of it. It's, it's so personal to you in, in so many ways. Explain to anyone who doesn't know what the film's about. Congratulations on the show. Thank I'm you. so excited to see it. It really lives on my street. For anyone who doesn't know, tell us what it's about and who you play. What a, what a thrill. I'm, I'm going to say it. You're two of my favourite people. Why? No, I'm not lying. <laughs> no, I'm honestly not. You're two people who I've spent time with both of you, and I've always thought, oh, it would be nice to be their friend. You know, I've always thought that, and I don't think that about everybody, and I think that about you two. In a way, Corden's selection as the late, late host felt like a network's attempt to have a performer who was malleable into what they had in mind to make the most money, but in doing so, left out the reality that makes late night hosts so appealing and believable in the first place, that Carson factor. Still trying to recapture something that was genuine to one person, and it's that contrivance that would ultimately be the undoing of a guy whose true nature was always the subject of public debate. But even with this in mind, how did everything go so wrong so quickly? Some of it may have been beyond their control. Others, maybe not so much. I think we're all feeling it. I'm sure a lot of you are, are, are feeling frightened. You feel vulnerable at the moment. And um, we want to take a minute to say, just know that you are, you are not alone. I just spoke about how late night TV had become rather safe, how someone like James Corden with all this individual flair considered still represented a rather played out presenting style. I've noted that generally ratings have nearly all fallen off in the last few years amongst the late night hosting scene and the decreased interest from younger generations in particular towards these hosts. For some late night hosts, they'd already created a riff when they attacked the concept of video games or aligned themselves too closely with an establishment. James Corden wasn't that kind of person on principle, but over time he became a poster boy for everything that young people despised. Rent in Manchester is now so expensive that students like Ella have had to leave the city. She now has a long commute from the other side of Liverpool. I think one thing that a lot of the people I spoke with talked about was how the economic uncertainty right now and the high cost of food and groceries is... Um, working people are 
being less successful than they have in the past in bargaining for their share of the wealth that they make possible. We're in the 2020s. There's a lot going on in the world right now. The world hasn't exactly slowed down at any point in recent memory. Pandemics, war, cost of living, it's been a lot for a lot of people, let alone a generation whose lives are currently being defined by them. And the statistics will tell you the same thing, that a lot of young people are being pushed out of markets that previous generations had long been a part of. The average age where certain milestones in one's life occur is gradually increasing. The gap between the wealthiest and poorest in Western society is increasing. I do think it breeze more cynicism. James Corden was kind of the antithesis of those sentiments. It's somewhat surprising, honestly, given Corden's background. He wasn't born into wealth. He didn't win some fantastic scholarship to any prestigious school of arts. He dropped out of state education as soon as he could and climbed the greasy industry pole. It wouldn't be unfair to describe him as probably the contemporary late night host with the most working class background. His story is one that could honestly inspire a lot of people who may currently be struggling in the show business industry. But he chose to take his late night and real life approach in a different direction and it wasn't one that resonated a lot of the time There's no lockdowns anymore we can finally walk out the door the sunlight is a fantasy it still doesn't feel real to me I understand that sometimes when we feel down and lost, we could use some joy in our lives. And most people, even young people, aren't averse to that thought. But I think there's a fine line between engaging with a person that cheers them up and engaging with a person that might insult their struggles, even unintentionally. It was one of the issues with a lot of the talk show hosts when they moved to hosting from their home during COVID. And in cases like Ellen's, you realized how extensive their properties were. When James Corden performed the No Lockdowns Anymore musical number and uploaded it to YouTube, many people all over the world and even some in the US were still in lockdown. I'm sure many many, myself included, were relieved to be able to step outside again without any constraints, but others were still worried, and I think Corden's tone of unbridled joy reeked of someone who hadn't considered those concerns. I understand that as a theatrical individual, Corden wanted to sing and dance and all that, but there was a time and a place maybe 2015 still. And then there was the politics, something that Corden Reed didn't have to include in his show, but he chose to. It was his choice, and I respect that. But once again, although young people are politically inclined and quite vocally progressive in their opinions, it's certainly not in the same way that previous generations and talk show hosts are. And although I think you'd struggle to call Gen Z as Trump supporters, I'd also say there was an apathy that didn't really identify with all the exceptional bashing that came with his presence. And this idea that Trump was the Antichrist, that Hollywood and the Democrat party were there to stop him in his tracks and save America. I don't think you'll see too many young people driving around donning still with her bumper stickers, if you see them driving at all, given how much COVID fucked up driving lessons. The younger generation are inherently distrustful of the government, the media, and the establishment in general. This doesn't mean that they align with everyone who claims to be counterculture or anti-establishment, but it was a damaging perception to late night, which has always been unapologetically mainstream, yet seemed to become even more so in the years prior. James Corden had largely joined this chorus, aligning himself with common values and tropes. In spite of his content's potential to reach new audiences and its viral success, the result was something that felt rather similar eventually. Although this information didn't set himself apart in a particularly good way, what he did on set didn't necessarily set him apart in a bad way either. No, it was what happened behind the scenes that really damaged him in that case. What can I get you, Matt? Can I get two fried eggs? Two fried eggs? All right. As I mentioned earlier, James Corden was one of those people who drew suspicion and animosity before any incident in particular was given airtime. But the stories about him often didn't deviate too much from a few key points. That generally, he was quite a cold person off set, didn't really have too much respect for those around him, and was somewhat arrogant and bad-tempered. The most common negative story about an experience with James Corden is not too dissimilar to that of Ellen, which wasn't helped when her ship sank. It doesn't help that most of these rumors were circulated around social media and forums which were dominated by younger people but also reports on an attitude that was out of step with the generation who are most likely to work in jobs that might suffer from maltreatment. Once again, from a person who clearly had his fair share of struggle to establish himself in the industry, even likely working a fair few McJobs in his time, this seems surprising. But anyone who doubted it would soon have to confront evidence that he was exactly that sort of person. In the heat of the moment, I made 
I made a sarcastic, rude comment. This left a lot of people rather unhappy with him, but for others and a lot of young people, this was a self-fulfilling prophecy. James Corden, in spite of his significant wealth, success, and pretty much everything that he had going for him, couldn't handle the fact that someone's meal wasn't to their specification. And although many would find it understandable to be sensitive to the allergies of a loved one and expect sensitivity, they would still not find it acceptable to lash out on a service worker over that because that is not their responsibility. The incident although occurring after the announcement of James Corden's departure, still highlighted the reason why he was never popular with the netizens. And since then, more stories have only continued to trickle out about how he's just a bit of a prat, even if it's nothing more. Despite his well-documented humble beginnings, by the end of his show, James Corden was perceived to be just another person living in a bubble, of which many people couldn't wait to burst. If anything, he represented the worst of late night, the most unappealing portrait to younger viewers, the person who puts on a fake smile, doesn't take their interests or problems seriously, and treats them like dirt in real life. And for someone who had likely been on the other side of his fair share of maltreatment, that was just disappointing for a generation that probably would have loved someone who actually understood those issues. Nevertheless, one can't help but think that even if he had a squeaky clean tenure, that many had already made up their mind. Most of the expectations imposed from years old sentiments and rumors. Was he doomed from the start to fulfill this fate? Or was there another way forward? They think that just because you have a Tonight Show that you must deal in serious issues. It's a danger. It's a real danger. Once you start that, you start to get that self-important feeling that what you say has great import. It was true that James Corden's reputation preceded him in certain spaces, particularly those inclined to be critical towards him. And it wasn't without its validity. Even in his autobiography, May I Have Your Attention Please, he acknowledges that there have been times where he has been entitled and unpleasant, and seems to not want to be that person anymore. That was 2011. And the truth is that if he was aware of it then, he had plenty of time to evolve and grow as an individual. And it's not like I think he hasn't. With or without both the are, there was still a significant cohort of people who didn't like him. And if they didn't exist, I doubt the Balthazar instant would have blown up the way it did. To me, he is basically the male version of Ellen with his failing late night talk show and dyed blonde tips of his hair. There's just something about that wry little smile and porky pig laugh that makes me think that he is an extremely fake person. If he was still as awful as some speculated him to be, it feels likely that we would have seen the sort of dossier that has been produced on Ellen, Fallon, and Clarkson. Particularly in light of the Balthazar instant where people would have felt more compelled to talk about their experiences with James Corden, with light to all the complaints about workplace toxicity and malpractice. We haven't seen that, and there's no overwhelming evidence to show that he is a malicious person. With that said, he is who he is, and if he has days where he's moody, frustrated, tired, and worn down, then those are what make him human. I think I would with his schedule. Some people simply don't have the patience or self-control to be complete saints day in and day out, and none of us were sitting in that restaurant. The fact that many have began to judge outbursts and tantrums on whether they can be justified or not is besides the point. People can break. I think what made people naturally distrustful of James Corden was this sense that something was being concealed. I noted earlier that the issue was when coming back to Ellen that she always promoted a message that she couldn't maintain herself. James Corden had that problem too, but he wasn't always preaching platitudes like be kind. No, for Corden, he had an additional issue, and that was said reputation. The problem is that the internet caught up to Britain in their assessment of Corden's character, particularly with how it has connected voices and opinions from all around the world, and the eternal nature of much that has been published on the web prior. Consequently, Corden's reputation caught up to him, and not assisted by the degeneration of Degenerous, it was a time bomb waiting for when he'd do something to confirm people's judgment of him. The notion that James Corden was actually a bit of a prick wasn't merely based on reports and rumors of him being a prick. There are plenty of people who are rumored to be pricks, people who are known to be pricks, unashamedly pricks, who still get plenty of airtime. The truth was that the actually part of that sentence is an operative word. It has to contrast with something. And for many, that was the outgoing, uninhibited, high-energy personality that often accompanied his presence. In the UK, that sort of personality always attracted suspicion because it felt superficial and like he was compensating for something. But there was no reason for that not to succeed in the US, and for a decent amount of time, it did. But maybe it would have been better if that specific personality hadn't. You were in a band before yeah. One Direction. What happened to them? Where are they now? <laughs> um, yeah, I think I was about 14 when I first got it. I've actually got the name of the band. It's called The Rogue, tattooed on my legs here. Right. right. Uh, so, it, it, you know, it's a special part of my life. Um, How old were you at this point? 14, I think, right. when I first started. I just said that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and 
Listen. Whether James Corden evolved as a person behind the scenes is irrelevant to general public perception because most of the time that's not the James Corden that people see. The one that matters ultimately is the one that presents the Late Late Show. It's why the opening episode showed promise in particular because it captured a side of him that many hadn't seen before. The sort of humble human individual who was grateful to be there and although he obviously couldn't adopt that approach for every episode, he just appeared to revert back to his original personality mixed in with some talk show host. The one that had caused so much suspicion in the first place. I'm going to take it back to one of the first sketches, the one where James Corden ridicules himself and the manufactured nature of talk shows. The overarching story is that he has learned to perform all these things, and even if it is satirical, the point remains the same. Why did he have to perform? Watch an old Johnny Carson clip, and even when he's terse, abrupt, there's an impression that what you're seeing is actually Johnny Carson, and that he's not afraid to portray himself in an unflattering light. That makes him more believable. But look at you. I mean, you don't really care what I have to say, do you, honestly? No, no. <laughs> I gotta do... I gotta do an hour a night. Yeah. I'm looking for warm bodies. Right. It, 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 it. That's all. Ah. If I, I can get seven minutes out of you, I take a bundle, I go home to Malibu. Corden had all these facets about himself that he always kept aside, and I think some of them would have actually made him more interesting as a host. It made him a far more compelling subject to interview from everything I read. Sure, his moments made him out to be a bit of a dick, but I think if he'd been less afraid to actually showcase that side of him, more with the actual nuance of context integrated into his tenure at the Late Late Show, it would have given people a lot less to pick apart. And it wasn't like he had to be another happy chappy on TV by 2015. We already had enough of those. Sure, there are certain approaches that would be incompatible with the talk show format, but one of the most successful talk shows in the last few years, particularly with younger audiences, is the Eric Andre Show, an absurdist talk show without any established structure at all. And although it serves as a satire somewhat, I think studios have long underestimated how versatile the format can actually be. And forget that many shows didn't grow from the roots of just harmless chinwags with celebrities and goofy moments. I think being able to be more comfortable presenting yourself would have made hosting a less tiresome job as well. Corden obviously puts a lot into his performances, even when they're in media, which I don't rate very highly. He's still a very committed thespian. Imagine having to put on that performance for eight years, back to back thousands of episodes. I think most would have retired long before then. Corden is a professional, which gives him more stamina than most, but the reason why some hosts have managed to stay in the late night hosting role for so long is because their profession comes naturally to them. It just wasn't, and I love that restaurant. I love the staff there. I hope I'm allowed in again one day. The fallout of the Balthazar incident was probably the most illuminating case of this, where on one hand, Corden makes an apology on TV with the desk in front of him and the smoothness, a silk over a bowling alley. And on the other, it's clearly frustrating in interviews with how his actions are being presented and perceived. The reality is that he doesn't really contradict himself in any of the conversations. He categorically denies being verbally abusive and states that it was a snappy, out-of-place comment. The juxtaposition of his feelings made the apology itself insincere, because he can't sit behind a desk and be annoyed with the persona he has saddled himself with over the last eight years. He couldn't speak honestly with his viewers. So the question is, was there a reality where James Corden didn't end up being a significantly hated figure on the internet? Obviously, we can't know for certain, but I don't think it would have started with him being the perfect person off his talk show. Nobody is, but the imperfect person on it. And that may just have made him a believable enough individual to actually convey those emotions when he didn't live up to the bar he set himself. Would that have won over viewers? I don't know. But it may have been a bit more sustainable for him and his reputation. Yet instead, the end of James Corden's namesake show, justified or not, feels like another nail in the coffin of late night. Is there any hope? It's also been a rough few years for late night talk shows, a former jewel in the crown of American media and their long established history. But the truth is that some of the most popular shows and even genres ended as new forms of media emerged and the taste of the general public gradually evolved. 
From the early 50s, late night has been omnipresent in the lives of many Americans, but they've always been changing and developing. What should Johnny Carson and Jimmy Kimmel clip side by side? And it's like chalk and cheese, but you can see how they existed in the moment. What is the late night show for this moment? Back in 2010, Conan O'Brien and Jay Leno nearly took down a network over one late night slot. Last year, a conservative panel show hosted by comedian Greg Gutfeld beat out Stephen Colbert in ratings, and Fox moved him to primetime the following year. To me, it feels like there's such a lack of identity that there's no longer a reputational stake to even fall under the banner of late night. It feels like it's losing ratings and doesn't know how to reach the new audiences who could be converted, so they just do very little. With all that considered, I don't think that the late 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 Show with James Corden was a bad attempt to try and reconcile those differences between media in 2015, even though he didn't seem like the ideal candidate to me. When I started reading about James Corden writing this script, I was unsure of what to expect. I often write about a lot of material as I go through it, so you're hearing my descriptions and reactions that are similarly new. I've never really been subjected to that much James Corden media, but from what I had seen, I wasn't particularly impressed. Sure, I was able to appreciate his credentials in the performing arts, but I was never able to understand what people saw in him as a TV host. Well, now David's a good friend of mine, and when I heard that he hasn't seen the fully finished statue yet, I thought it might be fun to switch out the real statue with one that we made a little less flattering. We want you to meet David Beckham. I kind of get it now that the network weren't exactly looking for a late night host in a traditional sense. They were looking for someone who had the potential to adapt content into more mediums that would reach new audiences like many contemporaries have successfully done. And in that regard, the Late Late Show with James Corden was an overwhelming accomplishment. People characterizing it as a failure aren't really correct. However, I think Corden's success was definitely indicative of late night struggle to reconcile viral success and long-term appeal. I'm just shocked I've done something that upset people more than cats. Although his creative intuitions were undeniably impressive, James Corden's physical presence was never necessarily the draw to the prosperity of that content. I think the best example of this was Carpool Karaoke, a series popularized by Corden but ultimately appealing enough to work on its own without him. Most of his content depended on a lot more than his presence, and although his talents in the vicinity of a lot of it worked to its benefit, it was also not the defining feature, which is why that series has continued even after Corden has stepped aside. The main challenge of selling the Late Late Show with James Corden outside of the general late night ecosystem was James Corden. If the internet had remained the same as it was in 2015 when he started hosting, I think he'd probably still be going today. Unfortunately, it moved at a pace that nobody, let alone he, could keep up with. Sketch comedians were no longer the most successful on YouTube. Audiences began to take more interest in individual personalities and credibility. And whereas some hosts would excel in this dominion, Corden was never quite able to win over that audience, likely because he was a performer first. The Late Late Show was still a performance. And although someone's on-screen persona is never identical to their off-air personality, I think Corden often struggled to present an on-air version of himself that was a natural extension which other hosts probably found more comfortable. Despite the more open format, he couldn't recreate the effortless warmth and charm that someone like Craig Ferguson or Graham Norton possessed. And without that, not everyone was won over. Some, in fact, quite the opposite. Come the 2020s, with a new, more media-skeptical generation on the horizon, we simply did not bode well for someone like Corden. But it wasn't helped when the kind girl of modern TV, Ellen, found herself in hot water. Regardless of what he did beyond that point, there was simply an air of suspicion around the all smiles, high energy type of people, especially with those who might have a history for being that sort of character, that whatever misstep they made would immediately be picked up. And they were. A big mea culpa from James Corden on his late night show as he addressed the controversy that erupted over his treatment of the wait staff at a New York City eatery. James Corden, whether it was a full on rant or a sarcastic moment of frustration, lost his call with a service worker who had nothing to do with a problem that needed addressing. And even if they were, it wouldn't have been worth blowing a lid over it. I'm not saying there's never a place or a time to talk to someone if they're performing a job in a way that detriments you, but it was a mistake. Mistakes happen.
Exacerbated by a very outspoken public figure, what may have been a 30-second interaction at a restaurant blew up to a weeks-long saga that fulfilled everyone's prophecies about the type of person he was, and it became hard to debate that judgment when others came forward with similar stories. Since then, every now and then, his name would be dropped by a colleague or employee who didn't appreciate his attitude when they worked alongside him, or saw him being a bit of a dick to another person. I don't think it's surprising that most of these reports came from panel shows or from those who had chance encounters with him. Unlike Ellen, it wasn't like James himself was unaware or actually actively hid that he may have an ego problem or could be abrasive and unpleasant at points. He was quite aware, and for all we know, he may have been trying to work on that. The issue is that the person marketed after midnight on CBS wasn't a person who possessed that self-awareness. I think that became apparent to many of those internet literates. It's true that younger generations seem to be a bit tired of how late-night hosts approach their culture with little understanding of their own sentiments, James Corden included. Yet, with young people being priced out of markets and feeling rather cash-strapped, I don't think there's anything more out of touch than being a super-rich host who can't treat those around him with a bit of decorum. And whether he was that or not, that's what James Corden represented to most online critics of his. A guy who simply couldn't appreciate where he was. Maybe that was just who he was. Staying true to his interview commitment, Corden hasn't really taken up any new major projects since his departure from late night. He turned down a significant pay raise and walked away from likely his most lucrative gig in his lifetime. I think that's probably telling about where he is right now that he felt it was a job he couldn't continue in the current circumstances. For the network, whatever goods James Corden brought in, they either concluded that they wouldn't be able to replicate it or that it wasn't profitable enough in the long term to sink a heavy budget into it again. It's a sad tale and one that you feel may have played out differently in different circumstances with a different host. But now all we're left with is another dent in the once formidable arm of a genre struggling to stand. James Corden took Late Night forward, but also showed its end, an amalgamation of everything that could bring in a new audience, but also everything that can alienate one. For all the prosperity, the result was still the demise of another iconic talk show, and whether he did more to expedite or delay it is a question that one can only lament. One thing seems clear though, if Late Night wants to reinvigorate itself, it's going to have to think a bit more outside the box than this chap. Thank you so much for your time everybody, I will miss you. Thank you and good night. Hey guys, yeah, so that was the video. I hope you enjoyed or took something away from it. Maybe it inspired a conversation or something that you think I may have left out. It's definitely one of those subjects that goes much deeper than pretty much any video I could make. So I'm always welcome to additional thoughts in the comments. I want to thank the editors for fantastic work on this one. They really, really hit it out of the park. All their links will be in the pinned comment below. We also want to thank the post editor and also the person who created the sponsor segment, Kojak. Brilliant work as always. Big thanks to Red Hunter who did the sound and Staffer who did the thumbnail. Very reliable individuals who do consistently great work. I also want to thank any artist whose art is... I am working on a new system for crediting that. Unfortunately, it's just been a bit chaotic. This video was actually meant to be the end of last year, but um, it would be more abnormal if my schedule actually ran on time. I also want to thank the sponsor, Rocket Money. It's been a pleasure working with you. And as noted earlier, all the links will be in the description below if you're interested in taking up that offer. I'd also like to thank my patrons, $10 patrons up on the screen right now, and my $50 patrons, Seri Tish and Hypercube. Thank you so much for your support. I don't really have too much else to add. I hope you guys are having a good 2024 so far. I would say new year, but I think we're past that point. And I hope the year continues to treat you well if it is. And if it isn't, I hope it improves soon. Anyhow, I'm The Right Opinion, and I will see you in the next one.